All right, let's get in the weeds here. Braves got their hands full. All right. They sure do. They sure do. My man Zach Wheeler is filthy. I was telling Mike before we get into kind of what makes him so successful and what the Braves do well and how he could potentially attack him. I remember it was 2010, 2011. I'm with the San Francisco Giants rehabbing, and they're like, hey, go grab a few ABs down in San Jose. So I get in my car, you drive like an hour and a half, two hours, and this guy was on the <laughs> bump for us, and I'm playing third base, and I'm like, good Lord. What is this? This guy's a monster. <laughs> Ends up getting traded for Carlos Beltran the next year. But I think for me, the Mets, right, whatever happens, happens. When he got that huge deal to go to Philadelphia, everyone was like, whoa. Yeah, like I think people thought he was overpaid. Yeah, it wasn't based on what he had done. It's what they thought he was going to do. do. Yeah. And I think he's, you know, next to Max Scherzer's deal, one of the best starting pitchers deals you could ever have. So let's get into it. We'll talk about what makes him successful. Eric Nays, researcher to the stars, wrote another manifesto here for us <laughs> to dive in on. And when you look at the numbers, since he's come over to Philly, pause this, bring up the first board, J-Mac. He's a top 10 pitcher in the entire sport. Innings, and that's the most important for me, being able to post 437, rank sixth, ERA plus, fielding independent pitching, HRs per nine, hard hit rate, war, all of it. He's a top 10 pitcher in the game. And he's dominated the Braves, right? Last 10 starts against them, he has been phenomenal. What makes him so successful? Let's get into the tape. When I watch Zach Wheeler, when he's got this low flying heater that seems like it's almost jumping through the zone, blowing guys away, 96, but it plays a lot hotter, 98, it plays a lot hotter. That's for me like the difference maker, the perceived velocity. So pause this, because we're gonna get into extension. Bring up the next board. He has arguably, I'm going to give it to you, Bailey Falter and Logan Gilbert are the only two guys who get out with more extension. Wow. So when you're in the box, right, we've talked about this. Got the average velocity sitting between 95, 96, and 97, but it plays hotter. So what does that mean? You can get in a box against a lot of guys, and Mikey, damn good hitter in the big leagues. A guy can be throwing 95 miles an hour, but it could be light. It could be 95 here and 95 right through the middle of the zone and you track it the whole time. But then there's other guys, and I can name a few off the top of my head that I faced that it would come out and you'd see like, ooh, that's 94, and then it's like, shoo, it's like snapping through the zone on you. And, like, I, and you can go almost the other way where you're, oh, that ball got by me, I look up, 91? I'm yeah. like, what? So that perceived velocity plays a big role. When I look at a guy, like Zach Wheeler. Reminds me a little bit of A.J. Burnett. You know, yes. the tall, lanky guys provide a certain elevation and angle the way they, they can come at you to home plate. But then when they kind of throw out of their ear, I think it gives, maybe it's the perceived motion that that fastball rises, but then I feel like the curveball or the cutter kind of comes from a low point back up and back down. Like, you know, the traditional guys that really throw over the top, that you, you feel like you can kind of see it the whole way. I don't, I don't think you get that deception compared to guys that kind of throw out of their ear and are tall. Yeah. I think that adds a, an extra d dynamic for Zach Wheeler, especially right-handed hitters. I mean, I just, I just look at that, the hard cutter, the hard slider, the curveball. Man, that can really put you in, in a different, I don't know, comfort zone in a, ne in a negative light, let's say. And, and he's just... What I like is when you sign huge deals in big cities, I think they're expecting you to be better than your best year. And he's been better he's and better. Exactly you know, he's that. answered the bell in a huge way. And Bring I think up it's the slow-mo cool. side angle of him, because this is what you're talking about. Being able to get extension, get back into it right here. Watch this, watch him reach. And you, so he sits at 96 to 97 miles an hour, but he gains so much ground going forward. That's what made Randy Johnson. The stuff played, obviously. He was a unicorn. But the fact that it almost looked like he was handing the ball to the catcher made you almost like, I'm not just not used to seeing it. Okay, what else is different from Zach Wheeler? He's got your nasty slider to the right-handers, right? Here it is. 
I throw an occasional two seamer. I got the four seam hop on my fastball and I can blow you away with a nasty slider as well. Well to lefties he's almost incorporating and we're showing some down back foot sliders. He has gone full a rat pause this eradicate this the two seamer because a lot of lefties that's just two seaming into their barrel and they can shoot it the other way. He's gotten way more four seam. He's got a hard cutter that he throws up to left handed hitters and then he's got the back foot slider as well which he kind of has pushed back on. So he's got weapons to just be able to get both right handers and left handers out. And when you talk to the catchers in the game I say this all the time. If you can go to any quadrant with multi multiple pitches. with multiple pitches you can't game plan against it. You almost got to cheat and hope. Yeah it's a great point you make when you can go especially lefty. If he can come kind of up and in quadrant strike bring that up with the map. four seamer and then throw the cutter up as well. This is obviously from the catcher's uh, yeah, so catcher's yeah. perspective. So you're hitting left handed, right? Yeah. So he's a guy of 2017 through 2019. Yeah, it was almost was more down and in, down and in, down and in. And now it seems now like, like he's exploding. Up. Yeah, he's exploding and, and really exploiting the high strike for a cutter. So then when you have your sights on, hey, not only do I have to get ready for 97 here, that's a strike, the cutter here. When you see one that looks in the fat part of the plate and just dies and then becomes you know unhittable because it's low in the zone man it just opens up so many matchup problems but it you have to give credit to the guy who executes the pitch the game plan is great we can write the greatest one on paper you got to come through and he's done it in a huge way now he's had really good numbers against the Atlanta Braves but if the, the Atlanta Braves can hang their hat on one thing is that there's not a better team in the game handling high velocity and good pitching 97 yep. plus let's get into it they absolutely destroy high velocity you saw it in the Mets series and I want to give the entire team some love on this before I get into one more board. The Braves slug on 97 plus perceived velocity was 486. Dodgers were second Blue Jays second uh, Blue Jays third. But if you're talking about just straight ball players 2022 slug percentage leader, leaders for 97 plus perceived velocity. First off this is pretty awesome Adley Rutschman you got two in the lineup but Zach Wheeler's had Dansby's number. So I'm interested to see how this plays out the familiarity Braves had their battle tested but they got they got wounded yesterday. So and you I give this Phillies lineup they got some characters they're starting to really believe and you told me Rob Thompson's real. Oh he's a real deal I mean he's. I've known him forever. He was my first manager in pro ball in 1995 in the mecca of baseball only on to New York. Uh, <laughs> but I think he's a guy who first of all he's battle tested in the clubhouse. You know he was with great Yankee teams like he's been in Around this situation stars, not yeah. as the manager but he's been in this situation so he's not going to be intimidated by that and he's going to ride his horse like he feels good about what he has. So question for you Dero if you're Dansby Swanson. You know that you're in a battle when you're facing the elite pitchers in the game. Anyways, if a guy's got your number, do you stick with your approach or do you change? What 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 would you do? What what did you do? I always looked at it like, is he going to pitch to my weaknesses or his strengths? That and that's based on the confidence of. The, I knew Justin Verlander. Didn't we talked about this with Sandy Alcott. He's going to pitch to his strengths. I, I, that's the, what I believe. It's funny you say that because David Ortiz said he always felt like he liked facing the aces more because they, they trusted, they trusted their stuff. They so the, so the game plan the the historical data played more true for David. Now other guys hey I'm facing David I'm going to do something totally different because the guys like Jeff I go, Supan, this is how you Supan get torque used to drop when you can get that look at that when look you at get that. Shin. You know you're coming in hot. I want to face Zach Wheeler in a big game because he's going to show me 97. He's probably going to ride it up in his own. I have to keep him. Smoltz did a great job talking about the ability to slow the moment down and 
if he knows you're going to come outside the zone, he'll just flip you sliders all day and get you out of there. But if you get him back in the zone, he's going to he's going to give you something to hit. It's just a matter of if you can get to it. Yep.